Okay, so Genesis chapter 14. Uh, I'm going to read that whole chapter to you, uh, and then James is going to come up and speak to us on that. So page 14 of your church Bible. At the time when Amraphel was king of Shinar, Arioch king of Elisar, Kedalaomer king of Elam, and Tidal king of Goyim, these kings went to war against Bera king of Sodom, Bersha king of Gomorrah, Shinab king of Adma, Shemeba king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zor. All these latter kings joined forces in the valley of Sidim, that is the Dead Sea Valley. For twelve years they had been subject to Kedalaoma, but in the thirteenth year they rebelled. In the fourteenth year, Kedalaoma and the kings allied with him went out and defeated the Rephaites in Ashtaroth Karnaim, the Zuzites in Ham, the Emites in Shaveh Kiriathaim, and the Horites in the hill country of Seir, as far as El Paran near the desert. Then they turned back and went to En Mishpat, that is Kadesh. And they conquered the whole territory of the Amalekites, as well as the Amorites who were living in Hazazon Tamar. Then the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Admah, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zor, marched out and drew up their battle lines in the valley of Sidim against Kedalaoma, king of Elam, Tidal, king of Goyim, Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Arioch, king of Elisar. Four kings against five. Now the valley of Sidim was full of tar pits, and when the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some of the men fell into them, and the rest fled to the hills. The four kings seized all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah, and all their food. Then they went away. They also carried off Abram's nephew Lot and his possessions, since he was living in Sodom. A man who'd escaped came and reported this to Abram the Hebrew. Now Abram was living near the great trees of Mamre the Amorite, the brother of Eshkol and Aner, all of whom were allied with Abram. When Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he called out the 318 trained men born in his household and went in pursuit as far as Dan. During the night, Abram divided his men to attack them, and he routed them, pursuing them as far as Hobah, north of Damascus. He recovered all the goods and brought back his relative Lot and his possessions, together with the women and the other people. After Abram returned from defeating Kedalaoma and the kings allied with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Sheva, that is, the king's valley. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High, and he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. And praise be to God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. The king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, With raised hand I have sworn an oath to the Lord, God most high, creator of heaven and earth, that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or the strap of a sandal, so that you will never be able to say, I made Abram rich. I will accept nothing but what my men have eaten, and the share that belongs to the men who went with me, to Anna, Eshkol, and Mamre. Let them have their share. Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to be here for my yearly visit, <laughs> my annual trip down to Bow, or up to Bow, should I say. Um, it's good to see some, some old faces, uh, some new faces as well. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name's James. Um, I live on the Isle of Dogs with my wife and two children. Um, and I work for London City Mission. That, that's part of the, the connection between what I'm doing, where I am, and, and uh, the church here. So I get the pleasure of working alongside loads of different churches through London City Mission uh, with that goal of sharing the gospel uh, amongst the harder to reach people of London. So gangs, homeless people, uh, people from other religions, Muslims, etc., etc. I'm not going to go on a day. Um, I brought some flyers with me. Um, that was me before COVID. I was young and, and agile with very little hair. Uh, <laughs> um, now I look more like Esau. Um, but you can find out more about me there and the work I'm involved in and the work of London City Mission as a whole. We've been around for nearly 190 years, so I stand on the shoulders of giants. So I'd love you to 
pray for us, uh, support us if you like. Um, but more than that, I'd love to come out with you, go out with you. Let's, let's share the gospel with the people of London. Even the other day, I was out in Whitechapel doing a book table, sharing the gospel with Muslims, having some amazing conversations. Because um, it's good news. The gospel's good news. It changed my life. I became a Christian nine years ago. Totally messed my life out. Came out of the army. Worked as a bouncer. Got involved in drugs and drink. And then Jesus saved me. It's a good message. It's a good message. And London needs Jesus. Anyway, I'll shut up. Um, and I'm going to focus on what I'm really here for, <laughs> which is preaching. And I would do that if I had my Bible. But that's, that's fine. I've lost it. Who's going to be brave and bring me a Bible? There we go. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Ruth. <laughs> Bless you. Cool. Well, do keep the passage open. This is, this is quite a tricky one, isn't it? I was a bit frustrated when Ollie gave me this, um, <laughs> whether he did that on purpose or not. I mean, you've you not just got the crazy names that um, uh, Andy did a good job of getting through, but you've just got, there seems to be a lot of confusing things going on here. You've got all these different kings that seem to be fighting. What are they fighting over? And then you've got a list of like 300 men that Abraham recruits. Like, why is it just 318? And then you've got all this weird stuff going on at the bottom with Melchizedek. And yeah, it's just crazy. So first, let's just kind of go through the passage. But before that, why are we doing this? Um, well, it's important to know key information about someone so we know how to relate to them properly. Um, and the Bible gives us more and more information about God and who he is, how he works, and in particular, who Jesus is. So it's important to know key information about someone so you can relate to them properly. So if I give you this situation, let, let's say we're, um, there's three people in a room. You're, you're one of them. Uh, then you've got this, this child that's, that's strapped to this, this chair, and, and they don't seem to be doing too great. And then you've got this, this man that looks a bit scary. You're in this locked room, and he's got a knife, and, he, and he's holding it over this child. What, what are you going to do? Are you going to intervene and step in and try and knock this, this guy out? Is he, is he going to attack her? Is, is, are you going to call the police? Like this, surely this is a horrible situation. But when you find out a bit for him, more information, and you find out actually this is a surgeon who's about to perform life-saving surgery on this child, then it becomes a different situation, doesn't it? It, it turns from a, a seemingly bad thing to a good thing. And, and, and that's kind of what it's like with us and Jesus, how we relate to God. Once we have more of the accurate, right information, the better we can appreciate him and, and, and know him for who he really is. And so I hope at the end of this, despite all the confusion of Genesis 14, uh, we'll walk away knowing Jesus better. Um, Spurgeon, you might have heard of him, uh, he says this uh, regarding Jesus and how he works and his different roles or offices. He says, I dread the people who divide our Lord's offices, setting up his priesthood and denying his kingship, or vice versa. Half a Christ is not the true Christ of God. And so hopefully at the end of this day, you're going to walk away knowing a bit more about who Jesus is as the great king and also as the great high priest. Okay? So let's do that. <coughs> well, I think we can learn lessons from uh, seeing something done well, but also seeing something done really bad. And, and we can learn lessons about what it means to be a king. What, what, what is a good king? Well, we can look at this passage and, and learn some good lessons. Not from it being done well, but, but from actually the chaos that seems to break out here in Genesis 14. You know, why do we need a great king like Jesus? Well, because the kings of this day, Genesis 14, they've messed everything up, haven't they? You know, this is the first record of a war in the Bible. You know, let, that, let that sink in. You know, war is not meant to be a normal thing. There was no war originally. But after enough time, enough people get together, enough people who aren't perfect, things like wars start happening. They break out. Mass groups of people start battling one another. And the wars of this day, they would have been brutal, surely. Hand-to-hand -hand combat, you know, swords and, and arrows and spears. You know, that just, it would have been horrific to see. And we notice that the slavery and oppression that would have gone on on a mass scale. So you've got these, these five kings um, in the west, and they're subject to these, these, five king, these four kings in the east. Okay, so I'm going to try and summarize what's going on here. You've got the five kings in the west, um, and then you've got these four kings who, who are kind of oppressing them, ruling over them, and they, and they come from the east, like Babylon, that kind of area. And so there's, there's 13 years of oppression uh, from these four kings who are oppressing and enslaving and, and, and uh, you know, not looking after these kings, these five kings' 
from the uh, west. And so what do they do? The kings from the west, they, they, they rise up and they say, I'm, I'm sick of this. Let's, let's do something about it. Let's, let's have a war. Let's have a battle. Let's all come together and try and sort this out. And so the four kings, they all come down and then they start just destroying these five kings. It's a real mess. So again, we see the story of Genesis. Just, just a couple of chapters earlier, you have God in the garden with his people. Where everything's beautiful. And just a few chapters later, we have things like this. Slavery, oppression, war, mass killing. There's so much death and suffering. And even just the world is just affected by the, this, this fall of man. You notice in verse 10, you've got these, these pits of, of tar. In the Hebrew, it, it reads more literally like um, tar pits upon tar pits. Um, they're everywhere. They're, they're deep. And, and they, they suck down uh, unfortunate people who seem to um, step in them. Again, it's all horrible. It reminds me of situations um, that you might read of uh, in the Navy. So you've got... Um, Sailors uh, fighting one another in, in battleships and, and uh, when it seems to go wrong and the sailors try to jump overboard, they end up landing in shark infested waters. And there's, again, just, just mass killings. It's just horrific. This is the kind of world we, we, we live in. Things have gone so bad. And on top of that, we see in Genesis 14 that the innocent people are caught up in it. Someone like Lot, he gets taken captive, doesn't he? And there's something to note here. You notice in the previous chapter, in Genesis 13, you've got Abraham and, and Lot, they're, they're related, and, and Abraham lets Lot choose where he wants to live. Do you want to live in this kind of weird-looking dark place, or do you want to live in this, this beautiful green land where, where there's Sodom and Gomorrah and all these places? And Lot tries to make the best decision for him and his family. And that's what it can be like in life sometimes. We try and make the best decisions for our, ourselves and our family. We try and be as healthy as we can, work the best jobs we can, give as much as we can but sometimes life it just it just gets you that's life that's part of living in a, in a war-torn a, a sinful a, a world that is full of suffering it's not always our fault but again the whole thing here is a mess soldiers dying cleaning up the mistakes of the rulers and the kings above them now, you think we'd we'd learn as, as sinful humans messed up people broken people that we'd learn that this, this doesn't fix things. Violence only begets more violence. Again, remember the context of this passage. You've got Genesis 14 with all these kings. And a few chapters earlier, you had the flood. Why did God flood the world? Genesis 6, because of the violence. Because people were so violent, every inclination of their heart. All they wanted to do was just attack each other. And surely there would have been um, lakes and, and rivers and, and other um, bodies of water that would only have been there because of the flood. You know, just constant reminders of, of God's judgment and anger against a violent world. And yet these kings, they, they wade through these waters. They, they march on, filling the world with more violence. Do we learn as humanity? I, I don't think so. I think 4,000 years later, presumably 4,000 years later, after this event took place, World War I, the world to end all wars. That uh, didn't happen, did it? And so in the words from... from uh, Blackadder, a character called Baldrick. Hopefully some of you recognize that. Probably not. <laughs> War is a horrid thing. <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not great, is it? Uh, but but there's, there's good news kind of hidden in here as well. Um, God has made promises that despite all this chaos, he's going to send someone, a good leader, a good ruler, who's going to deal with his people rightly, who's going to sort out all the issues and the pain in the world. And he's going to step in and, and rescue the right people. You know, Genesis 3, that the serpent crusher, someone, someone is going to be born at some point of a woman, and he's going to crush the evil one. You've got Genesis 12, where these promises are made to Abraham, and, and, and so, someone of his seed, one of his offspring, they're, they're going to bring all the nations towards him. And that's kind of what the Old Testament is like. It's, you see all this horrible stuff that goes on, and it serves as like a black cloth on, on which you place a diamond on. The black cloth is there to show you how crisp and, and shiny and perfect this diamond is. And, and we just see so much of that. The darker and more broken the kings of the past are, and even of this day, the more stunning and beautiful King Jesus should become. And, and so let's kind of draw our attention to him. Let's leap from these bad kings and, and the mess and the war that we read off in this chapter to, to Jesus and, and compare. Uh, we read of Jesus in uh, Isaiah, this, this beautiful description uh, a quote that we read at Christmas, I think Isaiah 9, 
that the government will be on his shoulders. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. So we see this, this King Jesus, he's going to come and he's going to be better than all the kings who came before him. He's going to restore order um, from all the chaos that took place from all the raging nations that we read of in Psalm 2. So, we don't just learn to appreciate King Jesus from comparing him to the, the bad kings, but I think we see um, some good qualities that we can draw out of Abraham and apply that to, to Jesus as well. Now, Abraham, he's not explicitly a king, but he is a ruler of his, his day, a, a leader, and he, he almost lives like a, a king. But let's look at Abraham a bit and um, see the links we can make between him and Jesus. So, so first off, you notice this, this um, recognition that, that, that God, he turns the weak people into strong people. We sung it with the, the Cornerstone song, didn't we? Um, Abraham, he's got this trust in God to, that he's going to rescue his nephew. And Abraham is not trusting in his might or his strength. Abraham's not trusting in his, his political alliances with other kings, other people. It just says, is it verse 14? That he took 318 men... Just 318. I think that's why it's included here. Just 318 men. And he goes on this rescue mission. And then it works. Somehow it works. He doesn't bring these other men from, from Mamre there, along with him. He doesn't bring other colleagues or anyone. It's just 318 men from, from Abraham's household. People that are meant to inherit the promise of God. And he goes out and it works. All these huge armies that have been fighting. This military might of the kings of the east... And Abraham does it, not by military strength, not by political power, uh, but through the power of faith, humbly trusting God to fight for him. And this is exactly how kings are meant to be. Uh, there's almost like a guidebook. That's what the, the, um, the first five books of the Bible are. They're like a guidebook for how everyone else is meant to live after that. And that includes kings. Deuteronomy 17, for example, it says that uh, when you get a king, he is to focus his time on God's word, growing in humility and faith. Rather than having many horses, so that's military might, he's not meant to have many wives. That's not just like an adultery thing, but again, political alliances, because often you marry the daughter of the, the local kings and pharaohs and other people. So he's not meant to have many horses, not meant to have many wives, or too much gold. Why? Because he's meant to trust God. God is where he finds his value, his comfort, his security, his, his purpose, and ultimately his strength. Abraham really seems to live this out. He trusts God. But notice he doesn't just sit back. That's, that's not what I'm telling us to, to be like here. I don't want to say, okay, trust God, God will sort all your problems out, you, you can just stay at home, you don't need to do anything. No, no, no. Notice what else Abraham does here. Verse 17. It, it, Abraham, he gets the balance of, of, of faith and, and works. They, they come together. Verse 17, he strategically attacks when? At night time. So there's a plan. Abraham's planning stuff. And he, he comes up with a plan of, of having this, this pincer movement. He divides his men uh, and they attack from different angles to cause confusion and, and to be more effective. And he keeps hunting these people down, these enemies, all the way to this place, all the way to this place called Horba, which is at the northernmost tip of Israel. And that's a long way for them to go. So again, he doesn't just trust God and think, yeah, God will miraculously bring Lot into my camp. No, no, no. He trusts God. And he's obedient. So, we don't just sit back. Nor do we just rely on our own plans and, and push God out. Instead, we expect God to use our plans to accomplish his purposes. Or as Oliver Cromwell famously once said, trust God and keep your gunpowder dry. Trust God and keep your gunpowder dry. And keeping your gunpowder dry, in case you don't know, um, that enables you to fire your weapon. If it gets wet, then the explosion won't happen and the, 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 the bullet won't fire out the end of the gun. So, we see that being a good king, it's not about doing things our way, but God's way. Abraham recognises that fact. Uh, you see it especially at the end of the chapter. Again, this weird uh, discussion between these, these kings that Abraham meets. You've got the king of Sodom. And um, Abraham refuses to accept anything from him. Because, again, Abraham's a man of faith. He doesn't want to be known as a man of, of wealth who relies on worldly gain. 
he, he just he says to the bloke, I don't, I don't even want one of those shoelaces from your, your boot. I, I just, everything I have, I, I get from God. I don't need to take anything from you. Abraham trusts in God. And this trust, it's like a picture of what Christ is like. So, so how does Jesus resolve conflict? Well, again, it's not through making alliances, not through relying on worldly power, or even calling all his angels to come in and wipe everyone out. It's, it's by dealing, actually, with, with the biggest enemy in the world. It's not the Russians, or, or whoever it is. It's not our next-door neighbour. It's actually inside all of us. It's sin. Jesus offers forgiveness and a fresh start for all of those who just repent. They, they turn from their old way of doing things and they run to Jesus and they trust in him. When someone becomes a Christian, the change is so radical that uh, in the New Testament it refers to it as being born again. Born again. You think how stressful and, and, and life-changing and, and crazy um, birth is. And that's how crazy the change is meant to be in someone's life. The things you used to love... In a way, you now hate, and the things you used to hate, you now start to love and enjoy. That's, that's how Christ's kingdom grows. That's how he works. He gets to the heart of the issue, which is sin, and he changes us through his grace and his love. So, for example, <laughs> I know I'm being recorded here, but how do we sort out all the issues that are going on in, in Russia right now and, and Ukraine? Well, well, one way, surely, would be if Putin was to become a Christian. It doesn't mean that you're instantly this good person, but, but there's something in him, surely, that would change. These things that he, he loves, you know, he seems quite bent on destruction, um, he would then hate. Actually, I don't want to do that. And the things that he used to hate, maybe providing for others and, and caring in, in, in the right way, he will begin to love. Now, if I go missing this week, you're going to know why. <coughs> but again, this is how Jesus works. He's not just interested in one country, England, Israel, Russia. He's interested in the whole world. And as the king of kings, he wants to rule all of our hearts. Not out of fear, not as, we're not as slaves, but out of love, seeing what Jesus has done for us. So Jesus is a good king. And he, he, he wields all this authority and power as the son of God for good. Now, Jesus is great. He's going to get rid of every bad thing one day. Every single bad thing he's going to get rid of. Every evildoer. Every sinner, it's all going to be dealt with, destroyed. Every wrong thing is going to be made right. But actually, as I'm saying that, I hope you feel a bit uncomfortable. Because there's a dilemma there, isn't there? But we long for a king like this to deal with all the problems and the issues we see in this world. Uh, but actually, we're aware that we're part of that problem. You know, you point the finger at someone and three point straight back at you. Because none of us are perfect. As we sung earlier, you know, there is, there's no one good, no, not one. That's not just a song, that's a theological fact about you and me. We're all in trouble. If Jesus was to return now as king, wipe out everything that is bad and wrong with this world, we're all in big trouble. It's tempting to just end the sermon there, but I'm going to keep going. <coughs> so you see the dilemma. We need King Jesus. You know, he brings perfect justice. But then we see that Jesus isn't just king. He's also priest. And this is why this is really important. Jesus is a priest. And, and, and why do I bring this up? Well, before I get to the, the, you know, the, the ending, we're, we're going to look at Melchizedek, this, this guy who also seems to be a king and a priest. He's this mysterious bloke who just seems to turn up and he doesn't seem to have a, a background. You know very little about him. Um, but the, some of the New Testament writers, they're just obsessed with him. This book called Hebrews in the New Testament, essentially it's like a sermon and, and, and it's a big chunk of that sermon. It's all about this guy, Melchizedek, how kind of special and unique he was, and actually how he is very, very similar to Christ and what he offers. So, Hebrews 7, I'm going to read big chunks of that out to us, and then I'm going to stop and try and explain this as I go along. Because this is deep stuff. You, you, might, well, you might feel like you're drinking from a fire hydrant, but there's some really important stuff here. Again, because we love Jesus as king. We sing about Jesus as king all the time. But do we understand that Jesus is also our great high priest and what that involves? Let me read some of Hebrews 7. It says this, that Melchizedek was king of Salem and priest of God Most High. He met Abraham returning from the defeat of the kings and blessed him. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. First, the name Melchizedek means king of righteousness and also king of Salem, which means king of peace. 
So let me push pause on Hebrew 7 there. So yeah, in the Hebrew, king, melech. Uh, righteousness is sedek. So melech, sedek, melchizedek. I don't know. <laughs> uh, Salem, shalom, peace, king of peace. So, so he's a king of righteousness and peace. So he brings righteous judgment, this king, but he also brings peace somehow. Because again, if there was a judge to come in here, King Jesus came in, was to judge all of us, we're all in trouble. But how can he bring peace at the same time? Well, it's through his priestly role. What does that look like? Well, Melchizedek, let me press play back on Hebrew 7. Melchizedek is without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days nor end of life, resembling the Son of God. And so he remains a priest forever. Let's push pause on Hebrews 7 again. So what's the writer saying in Hebrews? We'll say that you'll notice through Genesis, there's this big theme of, of um, genealogies, like, like a list of names, your, your ancestry, um, where someone comes from, how long they lived, when they died, and who, who they gave birth to, and who their children were, and blah, 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 blah. But there's nothing about Melchizedek, nothing. And it's almost like it was deliberately left out, so that we'd assume that Melchizedek is really unique. He doesn't seem to have a beginning or an end. He's some strange guy. With Melchizedek, there's nothing. He's totally unique. And so in that way, Melchizedek, he's like a type, he's like a picture or a shadow of Christ, the greater priest and king. Now the argument continues as to how Melchizedek and Christ are better priests than the other traditional priests that we might read of in books like Leviticus. So let me press play again. Hebrews 7. If perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, so priests like Aaron and, and those guys, and indeed the law given to the people established that priesthood. So if the law or the priest could ever be perfect or bring perfection, why was there still a need for another priest to come? One in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Aaron. So what's he saying? So you've got this Melchizedek, he's a unique priest, and you've got these traditional priests. Why does there need to be another priest like Melchizedek? Why? Well, Jesus. He came along. He belongs to a different tribe. This is Hebrews 7 again. No one from that tribe, the tribe of Judah, is the line of Judah, no one from that tribe has ever served at the altar. It is clear that our Lord descended not from Levi, and he has nothing to do with Moses, because Moses said nothing about priests in the tribe of Levi. So, Jesus, like Melchizedek, is a priest, not on the basis of his ancestry, but on the basis of the power of an indestructible life. For it is declared, and he quotes Psalm 110 here in Hebrew 7, that you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Now, because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantor of a better covenant. Man, there are some big words there. They're, they're like, I'm not expecting us all to kind of get this. This, this is why I'm so frustrated with Ollie, because there's so much going on here. But bear with me. So, pushing pause on Hebrews 7. Jesus is like Melchizedek. Melchizedek is not from the tribe of Levi, where traditional priests come from. Now, that, that traditional priesthood would involve a lot of sacrifices, seemingly day in, day out, and the sacrifices would, would almost allow the, the forgiveness of sin for the people of Israel. But Melchizedek is from a different tribe, a tribe that wouldn't perform these kind of ritualistic sacrifices. And so he's different. The way a sacrifice from this priest would work is it, it, different. It would have a different effect. And King David, who quotes and writes Psalm 110 assumes that Melchizedek's seemingly endless priesthood, remember Melchizedek has no beginning, no end, no genealogy. Uh, it, Melchizedek is a type of the future Messiah, Jesus, who is to come. Jesus, who is genuinely endless. He has no beginning, no end. He's eternal, the Son of God. And so this endless priesthood is declared by the Lord. It's, it's recognized by God the Father in Psalm 110, where it says, Jesus, you are a priest forever. Okay, this is, still, <laughs> this is still a bit crazy. What does this mean? Well, Jesus isn't just another priest. He's not a priest that just keeps making sacrifices so that we can't figure out, you know, am I forgiven? What's going on? Is, is, is my sin? Is it too much? No, no, no. Jesus is so different. Jesus comes from a different tribe. Jesus can do something new. Jesus can offer forgiveness forever because Christ is forever. Just as Melchizedek looked like he was around for a long time. There's no record of his death or his birth. Jesus is genuinely around forever. Jesus genuinely creates a kind of new sacrificial system through himself because Jesus is the great priest. He starts something amazing, great, new. That's why it's called the new covenant. 
Let's keep going in Hebrews 7, and then I'll clarify any questions at the end. <laughs> so I'm pressing play on the last bit of Hebrews 7. Now there have been many priests after the tribe of Levi, Levi, but death prevented them from continuing in their office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. So what Jesus does as a priest through his sacrifice is permanent. Let's keep reading. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, because he always lives to intercede for them. Unlike the other high priests, the Levites, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sacrifices of the other people. Rather, he, this is Jesus, sacrificed for the people's sins once for all when he offered himself on the cross. Okay, so there's a lot there. There's a lot there. But again, you've got these weak, temporary priests who come and they die, they live and they die, they mess up themselves, they're not perfect, they have to say sorry to God for themselves and sacrifice something, then they have to say sorry for the people and sacrifice something. But Jesus comes along and he's perfect and he lives forever and he makes the biggest, the best sacrifice ever to take away our sin. It's amazing. It's amazing. So you've got these, these sacrifices that are being made by these traditional priests, and, and if the sacrifices weren't made, then, then God's wrath would, would come out and consume the people of Israel because either they take the punishment for their sin or this sacrifice does. But you'd have to keep sacrificing something because people would keep sinning and they wouldn't get it. But now Jesus comes in and he says, right, I'm just going to settle this. I'm going to take the punishment for all of your sin as the high priest. I'm going I'm to take that for you, for good, forever. Only Jesus, someone who is eternal, could bear the eternal weight of our guilt and our shame and the punishment that we deserve. Jesus paid that infinite cost and he eternally intercedes for us. That means that Jesus, he's alive now. He's at the right hand of the Father. And, and almost think of it like this. Every time we mess up, every time we sin, we do the things we should, shouldn't do, we don't do the things we should do. It, it must be, this sounds really bad. But in theory, it would be right for God to strike us down again. But if not for Jesus, who's the high priest interceding, getting between me and God and saying, actually, you can't smite him. You can't wipe him out because I was wiped out for him. Justice has been done. That's what it means for Jesus to keep interceding. And because he lives forever, there's nothing. He blocks the kind of wrath that should be coming my way. Why? Because he took it on himself. But we can have assurance that there's no condemnation in Christ that we are going to get to heaven as Christians without a doubt because Jesus is always going to be there as like our passport, as our ticket to heaven, constantly interceding for us. Now, if none of this makes sense, let me give you an illustration that should kind of sum it up. Maybe I should have just said this in the beginning. Um, <laughs> imagine there's a, um, there's a landlord and uh, there's a flat that the landlord owns and a tenant that lives in the flat. And the tenant... It keeps, he keeps trying to pay the landlord enough money to live in the flat. So he keeps paying up the money. And, and, and the rent is at £1,000 a month. And sometimes the tenant does well and he gets maybe £800, £900 a month. And sometimes he does terrible and he puts out £50, £100. Ultimately, it's still never enough rent. And, and the landlord sees this. The landlord sees that the tenant, he just can't pay enough rent. It's just not working. This, this standard that this tenant is meant to meet, it's just not working. And so what does the landlord do? He steps in and he pays the price for the tenant so that the tenant can live there. The landlord steps in and says, you know what, I'm just going to pay a billion pounds so you can live here for as long as you want. And I'll keep giving you a billion pounds for as long as you want. I'm going to pay the rent for you because I know you can't do it. Why am I doing this? Because I love you. That's, that's what I'm trying to get across here. Jesus is king, isn't he? He's king and priest. He's king, which means he's going to dominate his enemies and rule over the world one day. And he rules through the church and through us as we become Christians. His rule spans and spreads out as his kingdom grows through us. But that means he's going to punish and deal with every wrongdoing thing one day. And that's what it means for Jesus to be king, to deal with all the wrongdoing, all these enemies. And, and we're in big trouble because as sinners, we're his enemies. But Jesus is just as much priest and as a priest, he bears the costs. He, he bears that punishment that should be coming our way, and he takes it on himself. Jesus is the great high priest, but he's also the king of kings. 
And when those two facts, those two offices, roles, they merge together and they marry, it's a beautiful thing. So how do we respond? Here's, here's a couple of bits of application, and then I'll land the plane, um, and you're free to go, as it were. <coughs> so, a bit of application, some things to think about as we go away. Jesus is rightfully our king, isn't he? He didn't just risk his life. You think of Abraham, how scary that would have been, running out and, and looking for Lot in the night and then coming up with this battle plan. That would have been terrifying. Jesus didn't just risk his life. He gave up his life to rescue us. People that didn't deserve it. Lot, Lot kind of deserved it because he was related to Abraham. We don't deserve it. Jesus didn't just risk his life. He gave up his life for us. He is rightfully king of our lives. Our lives should revolve around him. Because of that, at least. Do we treat him like king of our life? Or do we act like we're king or queen of our own lives? And we just do whatever we want. And we just don't pay much attention to Jesus. And I know I'm guilty of that. Jesus has given up everything for us. So there's nothing that we should withhold from him. Our time, our money, our effort, our dreams. And for those of you that have been victims to injustice, do you see the comfort that comes with having an eternally good king on your side who will make everything that is wrong right one day? This was really poignant to, to me and my wife. She, she suffered this um, terrible assault on a, on a... Yeah, I don't want to go into too much detail. But um, it, it was bad what happened to her. And, and the guy that did it, he... <laughs> we were in court for months and months and months and months. And ultimately, he got away with it. And, and my wife knew what happened. It was even there on the, on the, on the camera. And it's just, it's so like horrendous. And yeah, he got away with it. The, the justice system of this country let us down big time. But it's known that we have a king, a good king like Jesus Christ, who's around forever. He's going to deal with this one day. That gives us hope. That is a good thing. It doesn't mean I want this guy to suffer. I'd love him to become a Christian. But we can know that any injustice we've faced, Jesus is going to deal with that one day. Do we know that? Do we live that out? Are, are we vengeful people who just want to make everything right now? Or do we step back and trust God? Let's keep going. Application. Do, do we rely on the resources that come from faith in God or faith in ourselves? Abraham had, had choices to make. He could, he could have, you know, he, eventually he took shortcuts in his life instead of trusting God. Um, but he did well here. He refused the money for... Um, for the, for the battle, he, he, he gave money to this, this priest, Melchizedek. He, you know, he trusted God when he went to rescue Lot. You know, he did things God's way, not his own way. But eventually Abraham messed up. He took a shortcut because God's way was that Abraham would have a child who will then essentially, you know, through his children, will, will, they'll fill the earth. But Abraham, he couldn't wait. He took a shortcut. He, he slept with someone who wasn't his wife. Genesis 16, Hagar. And he took things into his own hands. Again, how, how often do we do that? Do we take shortcuts or do we trust God? Is our faith in ourselves or in God? But thankfully, Jesus didn't do that. Jesus had choices as well. You think when he was tempted, you know, Satan offered, offered him the, the kingdoms of the world. And Jesus could have taken that. Physically, he could have taken that. Uh, and that was it. Jesus wouldn't have had to go to the cross or anything like that. He could have taken a shortcut. But no, Jesus endured the cross for us. Jesus had his faith in God the Father. And, and as Christians, he lived that perfect life out for us. For all the times that we take shortcuts and we mess up, we get Jesus' perfect life applied to us. But again, what do we do? Is our faith in ourselves? Do we want to do things our way? Sex before marriage? Gambling for money instead of earning it? Trying to get to heaven now instead of waiting for it? What do we do? Do we trust ourselves, our way of doing things, or do we trust God? It's challenging. Let's keep going. I'm nearly done. Do we understand Jesus as our eternal priest who paid the penalty for our sin in full? Or are we going back to the old system of making sacrifices time and time and time again? Yeah, by going to church, uh, by giving up our time, by, by uh, giving away some money. These are like little sacrifices that we, that we give up to, to, to earn God's favor and, and to show him that, that we're his and that we love him and is that why we're doing these things is that why you're here right now it's like a little sacrifice of your time you, you, you know I could be having a lane I would love to have a lane but is that why I'm here speaking and, and helping Ollie out with this awkward passage is that why I'm doing this is like a little sacrifice to show God that actually I do deserve to have my sins forgiven 
Or am I doing it because I love him? Because I know I'm going to heaven. Because I know Jesus is my high priest and he's done everything for me. Let's not go back into that old system of constantly making sacrifices when we've got the once-for-all sacrifice of Jesus that applies to the Christian forever. There's no condemnation. When you see how much God loves you because of that eternal sacrifice, that should drive us to love people, to give up our time, our money. And lastly, do you see the security that you can have in Jesus as high priest? Do, do, you, do you have the right view of Jesus as your interceding priest? Uh, you know, again, w- when we mess up as Christians, when we make mistakes, whatever it is, big mistake or a small mistake, think of it as paying the rent, whether we come close to the mark or, or really fall far from it. Do we understand what, what Jesus does as our great high priest who's interceding for us? So you think you've got, again, you've got God there, and, and it's not as if Jesus is there saying, oh, oh man, just... just just give James one more chance. Like, he's an all right guy. You know, he's, he's preaching this Sunday. and just, just give him one more chance. I know he's messed up, but just, just hold back. Don't do anything. That's not how Jesus inter- intercedes for us. Jesus says, give me justice. You know, I've, I've died for James. I've, I've taken all his sin. I've, I've bared the penalty and the cost of all the wrongdoing that he's ever done. Give me justice. You know, James is mine. That's true of all of us, if you're a Christian. Isn't Jesus amazing? And there's so much more we could say here, and I encourage you to read this passage, Genesis 14, see if you can figure it out, <laughs> and Hebrews 7 and 8, bask in it, this, this whole concept of the new covenant, that we can know God, we can know security, we can know his love, and there's nothing that can take it away. We can be made right with King Jesus, we can enjoy his eternal kingdom in heaven forever. Jesus didn't just function as a king who came to squash us, but as a priest as well, who came to rescue us through his sacrifice on the cross. And if that's something you haven't done yet, you know, come and talk to me or, or Andy, and we'd love to help work through that with you. But I just hope you see the importance of knowing Jesus rightly. Like that situation at the start with the surgeon, the more information you get, the, the, more, uh, the better you can respond. And again, with Jesus, the more we know about who he is, as the great king and as the great priest, the better we can respond and live our lives for him. As the old hymn goes, knowing you, Jesus, knowing you, there is no greater thing. All right, let me me pray, and then I'll hand back over to to Andy. So Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for your word, and Lord, it can be confusing and, and, and rich and, and deep, and we have to mine it uh, sometimes, and, and Lord, I just pray that uh, some of the stuff that's in your word, that we've just, we, we've grasped some of it, the important truths of, of who you are, of who uh, Christ is, um, that he's not just a, um, a priest who has given up his life for us, and, and he's not a king. If we think that, then we'll just live the way we want. We won't submit and, 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 and obey and worship King Jesus. We'll just think he's a priest who's done everything for us, he's paid our price, and we can do what we want. Lord, forgive us for the times we do that. Forgive us for the times we flip that, and we think that Jesus is just a king. He's not so much a priest, and, and we've got to honor and respect the king, and it's all about me and how I can impress this king, and, and it's not about a sacrifice. Lord, forgive us, too, for the times that we slip into that side of error. But Lord, help us to truly understand that you are, uh, Jesus, you are, you are King of kings, Lord of lords, and, and the great high priest. Uh, the King who will uh, wipe out every bad thing, who will destroy uh, sin and death and the devil one day. Um, and Lord, without your sacrifice as the great high priest, um, Lord, we would not stand. Um, but I thank you that you are crushed for us so that we could be uh, raised up and adopted into your family as children of God. And I pray that we would all just uh, put our faith in you uh, this week, that this truth would affect our lives as we would know that we belong to you, uh, the King who gave up his life for people like us. Help us to know that truth, Lord. Help us to live it out and ultimately help us to share it with many people who don't know that, who want the bad things in this world dealt with and they don't know a great King. Uh, People that want a fresh start but they don't know that great priest who sacrificed himself for them. Lord, help us to share this news. It's too good to keep to ourselves. And Lord, may you just glorify yourself through us all uh, this week as we go out. In Jesus' name, amen.